What we're going to be going over here are basic earnings per share versus diluted earnings per share when multiple convertible securities are involved. And for example here, Corporation A has the following convertible securities. They have convertible bonds, $2 million worth, 8% interest, $1,000 par. They're converted into 30 shares of common stock per bond here. So the total number of shares of common stock they're converted into is 60,000 shares here. And we have convertible preferred stock, $4 million, 6% dividend, $100 par and each $100 par amount can be converted into three shares of common stock. So a total number of uh, convertible uh, preferred stock that can be converted into common stock is 120,000 shares of common stock. And then there's stock options that are granted here. And there's 75,000 shares of stock options sitting out here during the year. And they can be converted into common stock at price here $20 per share. And now the common stock's current market price here is selling at $25 per share. Okay, and then also the company has net income for the year here, $1.2 million, and they have a tax rate of 40%, and the common stock outstanding average number of shares here is 600,000 shares. Okay, so what we're going to be looking at here is the basic earnings per share here versus the diluted earnings per share. Okay, and for diluted earnings per share, we assume that the they were going to have they're going to be converted here those uh convertible securities into common stock as of the beginning of the year here and then as of uh, we're going to be this net income here for the year that's what we're looking at as of the end of the year here and that would include the re uh, reduction here for bond interest and also uh, preferred stock dividends here so net income uh, would include the uh, bond interest expense for the year here plus any preferred stock dividends that would have been paid. Now when we include the convertible security in the earnings per share here unless the security is anti-dilutive and we'll be looking at that here. So first off for our diluted earnings per share this is what we have here. We have the net income here and then we're going to have some a dividend and interest of effect here that's going to affect our net income and then we would divide that by the average number of shares of common stock outstanding plus any converted shares here or potential shares that could be converted. So first looking at we're going to be looking at our numerator here versus our denominator when we're making these calculations. Okay so first off here if we look at uh, stock options and stock uh, warrants. There would be no effect here in the numerator. They wouldn't affect any net income amount here, so there wouldn't be any effect that we'd have to add or subtract for those. But when we're talking about dividends here for uh, this convertible preferred stock, uh, since they would be converted at the beginning of the year here, we would pay no dividend here. So uh, the net income at the end of the year would have included that dividend here. So we got to add it back here when we're looking at this uh, diluted earnings per share. As of the beginning of the year, the dividend would be added back. And the same thing for the interest here. The interest, uh, you would be no interest on convertible bonds for the year here. Uh, sent because they would have been converted as of the beginning of the year here. So we're going to have to also add that interest expense back here on those bonds since that was included in the end of year net income. But one key item here with the bond interest here, that it would be added back net of taxes. So that interest expense for the bond has to be net of taxes because it was tax deductible. Whereas the dividend here didn't involve any tax deduction. So that we're just adding back at the dividend rate here. And then uh, converted shares here, well, we can easily figure that here for our bonds and our preferred stock, but when we're coming uh, in with options or warrants, we have to go through a little formula here to determine the um, uh, potential shares that could be converted. And just looking at here, uh, you take your market price here per share of stock, the op minus the option price, divide it by the op market price here, times the number of options or warrants here, and that's going to give you your number of shares here, those potential shares here that would be converted. Okay, so let's go up and let's look at the case here for our basic earnings per share here. This is where there'd be no dilutive securities involved. So this is what we do. We take our net income for the year here, but this is where we have to subtract out the preferred stock dividend. That always has to be subtracted out here. Divide it by the average number of shares of common stock outstanding. That's going to be our earnings per share here for common stock. No, that's where 
for the basic earnings. It's not dilutive. There is no dilutive securities involved here, but we do have to subtract out the preferred stock dividend for the year. So for our basic earnings, just going, we had 1.2 million here in net income. Subtract out that preferred stock dividend here, uh, 4 million times that 6% dividend rate, 240,000 here from our net income, divided by the average number of shares outstanding, 600,000. So we come up with our basic earnings per share here at a dollar 60 cents per share. Okay, so next we have to deal with our diluted earnings per share here. Now this is where we first have to determine, and I'll classify it here as a numerator effect uh, divided by the denominator effect when we're looking at these, these uh, convertible securities here, because this is we have to do this first here to determine uh, how we figure out our uh, diluted earnings per share in order in the order that we take and determine our diluted earnings per share. And you're going to see what's going on here. So first, we will look at looking at our options here. We have those 75,000 shares, market price here uh, for common stock, $25 per share, and the option price here is $20 per share. So looking at our first we have to figure out our numerator effect here. That is really what affects our net income here. Well, with options, like we said here, there was nothing that affected our net income, so it just has a zero effect here. But the number of shares or the potential shares that would be converted here, uh, we have to go through that formula here. Market price 25 less the option price uh, $20 divided by the market price 25 times the number of options outstanding 75,000 shares here that equals 15,000 shares that would be the denominator effect here and we could go that's at affects the average number of shares of common stock outstanding but division shows here as far as our numerator and our denominator effect when it comes to that earnings per share and what we mean by that is the what this the numerator here is what's affecting our net income for the year here and the denominator is what's affecting the average number of shares outstanding that we went through so it has zero effect here on a per share basis based on our on our diluted earnings per share next for our bonds here we look at that two million here eight percent interest rate they're converted into sixty thousand shares of common stock so for our numerator here this is where that we have that bond interest expense that has to be added back for the year but that's net of taxes so we have the bond at two million here a dollar's worth times that eight percent interest rate one minus the forty percent tax rate here so that's net of taxes so our bond interest expense here is ninety six thousand dollars so that's what it would have to be added back to our net income here ninety six thousand dollars now we already said we converted uh, if we converted those bonds into common stock as of the beginning of the year we have 60,000 shares here so this is what affects the average number of shares outstanding 60,000 so what we would do here for our numerator 96,000 shares here of interest adding back and 60,000 shares here of potential shares that would be added to outstanding here or that would be potential shares or converted shares here 60,000 so our effect here uh, based on our uh, uh, diluted earnings per share here would be a dollar sixty cents here per share next for our preferred stock well we had four million here outstanding six percent dividend rate in say they were they were converted into a hundred twenty thousand shares here common stock so uh, as far as our numerator effect what affected would affect our net income here is because we're converting those over as of the beginning of the year here we would add back the dividend here of two hundred and forty thousand dollars worth here in our numerator and then for our denominator that would require issuing an extra hundred twenty thousand shares of common stock so numerator here two hundred forty thousand divided by the denominator of hundred twenty thousand we get two dollars per share here the uh, per share effect for the dilution well why did we go through all this here we first we figured out our options here at zero effect per share our bonds at a dollar sixty cents per share effect and then our preferred stock here at two dollars per share effect well what we have to do is we have to rank these from the lowest to the highest and that's the basis that we're going to use for determining our diluted earnings per share here so we we would start with the 
first, our lowest amount here to determine our diluted earnings per share with our options here at a zero amount. And then we would, next we would go through the bonds because that's the next highest amount. We'll add those into our diluted earnings per share to see if they become anti-dilutive. That's really what we're looking at here. So options we can see there's going to be no chance of those becoming anti-dilutive here or increase our earnings per share. Whereas the bonds we're not quite sure at. They're a dollar sixty cents here. And next we'd have the preferred stock. This is the next one we're going to look at when we do our conversion here at two dollars per share. So either our bonds or our preferred stock could be anti-dilutive which could actually increase our earnings per share. But the first thing we were going to go with here we're going to look at both are since our options don't include any anti-dilutive effect so next we'll go with our bonds here at a dollar sixty cents and then we'll finally use the preferred stock so let's look at what we're doing here based on that ranking so okay first off for our diluted earnings per share here we're going to calculate that out here so when the options we're going to include because they're not we know they're not dilutive or they're not anti-dilutive but the bonds here we're going to have to determine if they're anti-dilutive so we take our net income here for the year 1.2 million and then again remember we stack uh, we subtract out that preferred stock dividend here of 240,000 here even though we're only looking at our options and our bonds here for the anti-dilutive effect we still have to subtract out that preferred stock dividend here but for the only thing that's going to affect our numerator here in our earnings per share are those bonds here. That interest has to be added back here net at tax of so 96000 And then for our um, shares outstanding here, our average common stock out shares. So we had 600000 here for the company uh, as on our average shares outstanding. But since those, uh, what was that here? That was our options here. They equated to 15,000 potential shares that we'd have to add back to our shares outstanding here and then the bonds that we had at 60,000 shares the potential number of shares of bonds that could be a would be outstanding based on converting them at the beginning of the year here so what we would do coming up with all our divisions here were for our, when our options and our bonds are included here in our earnings per share we're going to come up with a diluted earnings per share here at a dollar fifty six cents per share and in in fact the earnings per share here is diluted because going back we would compare that to our basic earnings per share here at a dollar sixty percent as dollar sixty cents per share that we calculated so you can see here the earnings per share have reduced here a slight amount here from a dollar sixty to a dollar fifty six so that we have a diluted earnings per share so our options and our bonds would be included in our calculation here when we state this on our financial statements for the company but now let's go down here and look at our last case here this is where when our options bonds and the preferred stock is an included here and you're gonna we're gonna find out by including the preferred stock here based and we're doing that based on our ranking here this rank the preferred stack was the highest ranked uh, effect here on the earnings per share that we calculated so we're gonna include that last here since that was the highest and the last one in our ranking so and we're gonna find that it to be anti-dilutive so just going through what we had here for our bonds and our well for our, our net income we had at 1.2 million then uh, for the year here but we had to subtract out the preferred stock dividend here at 240,000 from it but now since we're including those preferred stocks here we're going to have to add back that 240,000 here in dividends that's paid out since they would have been converted into common stock here and then again on affecting our net income would have been that bond interest expense here net of tax of 96,000 okay so here's then for our denominator of course we got 600,000 shares outstanding here and then we add two at that 15,000 shares here for our options and then this is the case here for those preferred stocks if they were converted over as of the beginning of the year we have 120,000 added in for those here and then for our bonds the conversion here was for 60,000 additional shares so what's going on here you just taken your numerator here for your your all your changes to your net income for your options your well the options didn't include anything here in net income but our preferred stock was affected here we increase well we subtracted out originally here uh, we have to subtract that out but now we're adding it back plus our bonds we had that interest expense after taxes added back and then we 
do your arithmetic up here and then just divide it by the number of shares that are outstand common stocks outstanding here plus the potential shares based on our conversion here and you're going to come up with this diluted diluted earnings per share here of a dollar sixty three per dollar sixty three cents per share now it really isn't diluted here well it's diluted based on the uh, convertible uh, securities that we included here but it ha uh, this we're going to find out this preferred stock had an anti-dilutive effect here since uh, we were looking at our dollar sixty cents here per share then we moved down to a dollar fifty six cents per share and then when we included that preferred stock in here we moved back up to a dollar sixty three cents per share so the preferred stock Adding that in here, it became anti-dilutive. And what you would do in that case here, you would not include your preferred stock in your um, dil diluted earnings per share. You do not include the preferred stock because it's anti-dilutive. Okay, so we went through our little example here. And let's just go back and look at it one more time here. Uh, going back up here, just remember here, when you're working with these diluted earnings per share here, you really want you have to rank all your convertible securities by the effect that it has on the numerator or essentially our net income for the year here and then the effect that it has on the denominator here that's really the number of shares outstanding and you have to rank each one of these convertible securities based on its effect here per share on that numerator and that denominator and you rank them out you determine their ranking here you have to determine the effect that they have here and you would rank them from the lowest here to the highest amount here and that's the order that you have to determine your diluted earnings per share and you do include each one of them out there based on the rankings here so for our options here well it didn't have any effect so we can include that in a diluted earnings per share but then when we got down to our bonds and our preferred stock here we had to rank those here so we started with our bonds here to determine any dilutive effect on our earnings per share and it, in fact it was dilutive but then when we added in the preferred then we add in our preferred stock here we don't look at them separately here we just they're they're additive onto each other so you'd start with your options in this case then you add in your bonds to determine your diluted earnings per share and then in this case we go to the next highest security a convertible security or as a preferred stock we added that in and in fact we found that to be anti-dilutive so that's what you have to do here you have to earn determine your uh, change here per share change here um, for each of the, your convertible securities and then you Start with the lowest ranked uh, security here that has the least uh, uh, effect here on the earnings per share and then you move on up and you have to include each of these separately here when you determine your earnings per share and if you get any of these where they're anti-dilutive that is they increase the earnings per share here then you have to exclude them from your calculation and just keep on moving on up like that so okay so that's what you have to do here when you have to determine your diluted earnings per share